he has nothing to fall back on now. The Burnham wood has come down on him. The man not born of woman is standing in front of him. The only certainty is death. And the only thing he can fall back on is his own strength. Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. We are doing this video lecture series on the textual reading and analysis of Macbeth and I'm happy to announce that this is going to be the last video of this textual analysis. We have already completed 19 videos with almost 10 hours of content which is absolutely free. So feel free to go through all of these videos where I have dealt exclusively and in details on each and every scene of this play. This is going to be the 20th video in the series and we will be making some more videos on Macbeth on various aspects of the play but right now this is the final part. So stay with me till the end of this video. This is Monami Mukherjee. Welcome to our channel. In the previous video, we have finished in the heat of the battle. Macbeth was fighting hard with his armor on. His castle was surprised by Malcolm and his men. And the last person whom we saw Macbeth with was young Seward, uh, whom Macbeth killed. Now in this scene, we will see Macbeth come face to face with his worst enemy, who is none other than Macduff. So let's begin the scene. Why should I play the Roman fool and die on my own sword whilst I see lives the gashes do better on them? Macbeth has two options right now. One, he can kill himself and two, he can fight his enemies. But he knows that there is hardly any chance that he will win any battles now. But he decides to go on fighting and does not want to die like Roman heroes who quoted death uh, once they were defeated. Whilst I see lives, while he sees soldiers about him, attacking him, the gashes do better upon them. So if I see soldiers, it is better that I put some wounds on them. So we see here the fighting spirit of Macbeth, which does not decide to surrender so easily. Now, Macduff re-enters the stage. Turn, hellhound, turn. The phrase hellhound is quite appropriate here from Macduff's perspective because Macbeth has sent his wife and kids into the darkness of death and it is natural for Macduff to feel that Macbeth is the very impersonation of devil. So he calls Macbeth the dog of the hell or the hellhound. Of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. Macbeth knows that once he has killed Macduff's family, his soul is tainted with Macduff's blood and he does not want to spill any more of Macduff's blood. Plus, possibly he is a bit frightened too of Macduff because we know that he has always been quite wary of Macduff uh, as he had confessed to the witches too. I have no words, my voice is in my sword, thou bloodier villain, than terms can give thee out and they start fighting. So Macduff does not want to waste any time talking and he attacks Macbeth and they fight each other. Macbeth still has some ounce of confidence left in him uh, now that he knows that no man born of a woman can kill him and he says uh, a few things to Mac Macduff while uh, fighting him. Thou losest labor, you are wasting your energy. As easy mayst thou the intrenchant air with thy keen sword impress. Now this is the typical way in which uh, Shakespearean blank verse is written. Uh, if we just rearrange the line, uh, we will be able to understand the sentence better. As easy 
means thou impress the entrenched air with thy keen sword. So, uh, the meaning of the sentence is, you will be able to affect or impress the air with your sword, but you will not be able to affect me with your sword. You have already had an idea about Shakespearean blank verse now that you have covered practically the whole of the play. Uh, so, you have to remember that when you face any problem in understanding the meaning of any particular sentence, try to locate the verb of the sentence, especially in Shakespearean drama. Try to locate the verb of the sentence and try to place the verb in between the subject and the object of the sentence and then the meaning will be far clearer. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. So let your sword fall on bodies that are vulnerable which can be attacked. I bear a charmed life. So my life is a blessed one. I'm not going to be affected by people like you which must not yield to one of woman born. So I will not be killed by anybody who is born of a woman. So there's no point in fighting me. Despair thy charm. So right where Macbeth has his confidence is where Macduff is hitting the hardest. And let the angel whom thou still has served. So angel here definitely means devil. Let the angel whom thou still has served tell thee Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. Macduff gives an information, an information which the audience does not possess, an information which Macbeth was not aware of. And this information breaks down all his confidence like a pack of cards. Accursed be the tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. His confidence, his strength, his bravery was founded on this idea that there can be no man who is not born of a woman. Technically, Macduff is not saying that he was not born of a woman. What he's saying is that he was a premature baby, which means that his development as a baby completed after he was taken out of the womb which happens in case of premature babies. And therefore, he is not technically woman born. You get it? So he got his body outside the woman's womb. So that is what he means by not born out of a woman. And be these juggling fiends no more believed that palter with us in a double sense. Macbeth had admitted earlier too that these weird sisters and these prophetic visions, they are equivocators. They speak with a double sense and he is admitting it over again. But he knows that it is too late. He has already made his horrible mistake. That keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope, I'll not fight with thee. This is a moment where he decides to stop. Because the core of his confidence is shaken, it's broken completely. And he does not want to fight Macduff. But will he be able to make any decision now at all? Is he in charge anymore? Then yield thee, coward, and live to be the show and gaze of the time. So, fine, don't fight me. Yield, surrender, I'm going to kill you anyway. We'll have thee, as our rarer monsters are, painted upon a pole. When a treacherous person is executed, then his head is displayed on a pole, stuck on a pole, where people can see this whole spectacle and see how a tyrant is brought down. And under it, here may you see the tyrant. So Macbeth's head will be put on a pole and the inscription will go that this is a tyrant. I will not eat. So Macbeth feels that he's going to die anyway. At least he will have the satisfaction that he fought till the end. To kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rebel's curse. 
So I have to surrender. That means I have to accept Malcolm as my king and then my life won't be spared. So I'm going to lose it anyway. Though Burnham would be come to Dunsinane, and thou opposed being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. He has nothing to fall back on now. The Burnham wood has come down on him. The man not born of woman is standing in front of him. The only certainty is death. And the only thing he can fall back on is his own strength and his own core of a fighter and he feels that now that all these protective prophecies are taken away from him the protection of the armor won't matter too and he says before my body I throw my warlike shield and this is very strange because when did he put on his armor? At a time when the soldiers had not yet attacked. You know, long back, remember the time when I told you that he's going to wear his armor now as an emotional support. Then he did not need the armor. Now he needs his armor. But when he needs it the most, he casts it away. So he is playing the Roman fool here. He is surrendering to death and tries to elude himself that it is a heroic way to do. Lay on, Macduff, and damned be him that first cries, hold, enough. Let me fight you and let me never surrender before you kill me. And they exit fighting, they re-enter fighting. So the audience is gripped by this movement on stage. Two of them fighting with their swords, going back, coming front, and going off stage, coming back on stage. And finally, in front of the eyes of the audience, Macbeth is killed. When he is killed, he is not killed with a knife or a dagger. Those are the things that the thieves and robbers and murderers use. Macbeth is killed by the valorous weapon, the sword. Because this is not murder. This is not killing. This is execution. This is a justified punishment meted out to the deserving. Macduff has his revenge accomplished. And in these moments, we see reflections of revenge tragedies within the framework of the historical play and at the same time this is also a personal tragedy because no matter how much punishment is given to Macbeth, Macduff's life is never going to be resolved. Speaking of resolution, because this is the final part of the play, this is the part where we have the resolution of the play. The play does not end with Macbeth's body lying on the stage filled with blood and gore. No. The play has to end with some sort of peace. And how is that achieved? Now the word resolution, it contains the word solution. It's like re-solution. So there's a problem and then that problem is solved. Macbeth was the problem. Macbeth was the chaos and removing Macbeth turns chaos to order. So the solution offered to the problem of the play, the complexity of the play, that is the resolution here. And how is that brought about and what happens to the audience who are witnessing this resolution? Malcolm enters the stage with old Seward. Now this old Seward is going to face some bit of bad news because his son is slain. I would the friends we miss were safe arrived. So they don't know which soldiers have died, who have survived. They don't know anything yet. Some must go off. Go off means killed. Yes, of course, some of their soldiers were definitely killed. And yet by these I see so great a day as this is cheaply bought 
by the count of the number of soldiers who were killed from Malcolm's side, Seward feels that this victory is cheaply bought, which means that he was expecting more body counts. He was expecting more deaths. So he's happy about the whole thing. He doesn't yet know that his son has died. Macduff is missing. And your noble son? Your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. This is a roundabout way of saying that he has been martyred, he's killed in war. He only lived but till he was a man. We know that young Seward was a really young man. The witch no sooner had his prowess confirmed in the unshrinking station where he fought but like a man he died. There is always a recurrent use of the masculine aspect of a soldier uh, whenever bravery is mentioned. You know, whenever you are a brave soldier, you must have been fought like a man. And uh, here man doesn't always uh, refer to the male uh, gender, but man as in uh, a fully grown person. So he is a child to these uh, veteran soldiers, but he fought like a man, an adult man. Then he is dead. I and brought off the field. Your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. So Ross is trying to offer some consolation to old Seward. Had he his hurts before? Which means, was his wound on the front side of his body or back of his body? Why is Seward asking this? Because if his son fought bravely facing the enemy, he would get his wound on his chest. And if he was running away and got his wound while escaping, his wound would be on his back. For Seward, whose son is already dead, it is more important right now to understand that he fought bravely at least. I on the front, why then God's soldier be he? Had I as many sons as I have heirs, I would not wish them to a fairer death. And so his knell is known. So his death bell is stolen. And this is some real heroic sentiment that Seward is showing. And this is something very Scandinavian too, you know, uh, because heroism, physical heroism is so important. Concepts of martyrdom, concepts of fighting for the noble cause, all these concepts are so deeply engraved in the soldier's mind uh, that perhaps becomes a motivation for them too. You know, if you are not motivated to die for this cause, to die for your team, then half of your bravery will be gone. So Seward feels that this is the greatest consolation that his son fought bravely against a tyrant and he feels that there is no regret in him. He is worth more sorrow and that I'll spend for him. He is worth no more. Malcolm is saying that yes, we should really be sorry that he is no more and his father is saying that no, we don't have to be any more sorry. They say he parted well and paid his score. And so, God be with him. Here comes new comfort. And now because Macbeth is responsible for young Seward's death, the only comfort old Seward can have is to see Macbeth dead. And so now that Macduff enters the stage with Macbeth's head, he feels comforted. Re-enter Macduff with Macbeth's head. Hail King! Macduff is referring to Malcolm, of course. For so thou art. Behold, where stands the usurper's cursed head? Look, I have brought the head of Macbeth for you. The time is free. I see thee compassed with thy kingdom's pearl. The greatest noblemen are compared to the pearls, expensive jewels in uh, the court of Malcolm and they are surrounding Malcolm that speak my salutation in their minds whose voices I desire aloud with mine 
hail king of scotland so he wants all present to welcome and greet malcolm as the king of scotland now i want to pause here a little bit macbeth's head is brought on the stage why is this important of course when a tyrant is killed his head is displayed all around so that people get a message that this happens when you you know flout the rules of ethics and morality when you go against god when you go against the rules of humanity this happens when you do something really evil like macbeth did that is fine But what about the head i'm sharing a very unrelated fact here with you i'm talking about a research that was made on gilletin gilletin is that execution device that was used in france to behead people to cut off their heads it was a huge structure with a lot of load a lot of weight and the sentenced prisoner or the criminal uh, had to place their head and that gilletin blade would come down and cut the head cleanly okay so that was the concept of the gilletin it was thought that the gilletin was the most painless way of killing because once your head is cut off you die instantly but then disturbing records came up researchers came up to the point where finally in the 20th century if i'm not very wrong it was something around 1977 my editor will put the right date he is very particular about dates i don't want to uh, piss him off by uh, giving any wrong dates here but it was something around 1970s that gilletin was banned and why is that because it was found out that some sensory perceptions are retained by that severed head because unlike the other organs of the body which when you cut off those organs die instantly the head contains the brain and the brain is the center of perception although it is not proved anywhere as to how far the head is capable of retaining any consciousness it is still believed that the head does retain perception and consciousness even though for a very short duration of time so when a head is raised on a pole head of a tyrant of any person executed on a pole displaying to the crowds it is not just the crowds which see the head but is the head which sees the crowd it is the head of macbeth who sees the fall of macbeth this thought gives me very eerie creeps you know does any human being deserve that kind of hell maybe maybe the kind of work that macbeth did all his life what else could he deserve so we don't know what happens after death we don't know if we go to heaven if we are judged by some angels if you uh, get raised from your graves on the day of the doomsday or kayamat we don't know if we burn in hell but we know for sure that macbeth's head was capable of perceiving and sensing unbearable pain and unbearable despair right before it passed it to the oblivion of death so it was not the moment where macduff killed macbeth it was the moment when macbeth's head was up on display Shakespeare does not use beheading of his heroes in all his tragedies not all his heroes get killed by beheading their heads are not cut off many of them die by poison some of them get stabbed some of them kill themselves hamlet dies too but he dies in a sword fight poisoned sword macbeth is beheaded so there's a difference maybe it was a different kind of dramatic justice that is provided here we as 
people of 21st century have not seen anybody beheaded, right? Not at least in front of our eyes. But it was a common experience for Shakespeare's audience. They had idea of beheading. And in not so very distant future, the people of England are going to behead their king himself. So for Shakespeare's audience, it was far more gripping a scene when Macbeth's head was brought inside the stage. Emotions like fear, pity, these are aroused. And you would ask me, why would these be aroused for a devil like Macbeth? Well, if Macbeth is a devil, what are we? Aren't we all Macbeths in our own ways? Don't we ever show ambition? Don't we ever show greed? Aren't we susceptible to these double talks of evil people? Don't we want to trust people who appear very sweet spoken to us? Don't we exchange minor favors without regard of morality? Are we always morally correct? Don't we ever trespass that bound? We are no kings and queens. We are no noblemen. So if within our middle class capacity, if within our humble backgrounds, we try to go beyond what is destined for us, then we call ourselves ambitious. We don't blame ourselves. Who knows how we would have performed if we were nobles, if we were, uh, you know, the king's right hand, who knows what we would have done. Macbeth's evil is so universal that it's very hard to detach yourself completely from it. And therefore, right where Macbeth falls, we feel scared that this is the fall of any man doing exactly what he did. And this could be my fall too. Pity and fear are two opposing emotions. When you look at the sufferings of a man who is different from you, you feel pity. Ah, that poor person suffering, you're distancing. But when you identify yourself with someone or any part of someone, then you feel fear. That is identification. If this happens to him, it will happen to me. And that is like terror. But if Shakespeare left you with these opposing, disturbing emotions, then this wouldn't have been a successful tragedy as per conventions. So he gives you a very short little episode of a single speech or a couple of speeches where he's offering you a resolution so that when you leave the theater, then you leave with a peaceful mind that order was established in Scotland. And this release of emotion, where you are taken away from your emotion, where you are given some peace, that is called catharsis. So catharsis, which is actually a medical term, uh, which according to the uh, Greek conventions, it, it referred to drawing some blood from different part of your body to release uh, blood pressure and ailments and relieve you of any disease. Here catharsis means an emotional release. So let's look at the last part where we are offered this emotional release, where we are offered this moment of relaxation finally, so that we can live at peace. The last speech is by Malcolm, who is hailed as the King of Scotland. We shall not spend the large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves and make us even with you. So he is ready to uh, reward people who have been with him and he has decided to name people uh, according to their uh, their contributions, Okay, reward them in a just way. And he goes on saying, My thanes and kingsmen, henceforth be earls. The first that ever Scotland in such an honor named. So earls are supposed to be a higher rank and he's offering that rank to his people. 
uh, what's more to do which would be planted newly with the time as calling home our exiled friends abroad now as chaos was uh, reigning supreme people were running off from the places uh, and somehow uh, malcolm wants to bring them home so he is trying to reestablish order so he's offering that kind of peace that fled the snares of watchful tyranny producing forth the cruel ministers of this dead butcher he's referring to macbeth here and his fiend like queen uh, he refers to lady macbeth as a fiend like queen who as it thought by self and violent hands took off her life so here we have some idea about how lady macbeth died that she committed suicide and that is what people say malcolm is telling us this and what needful else that calls upon us by the grace of grace so the way lady macbeth dies is also not uh, the right way to do according to uh, christian ideals because suicide is a crime a sin because you are taking your own life uh, you are spoiling something which god has created so in the her death as in her life lady macbeth becomes a symbol of evil a symbol of fiend and therefore uh, it appears that this kind of judgment that malcolm is passing matches with the general trend of people you know people actually believe these things that yes she was like a witch she was like a devil so thanks to all at once and to each one whom we invite to see us crowned at scar ends with the rhyming couplet but that's fine it's not like he's uh, connected to the devil because he's speaking in rhymes here uh, but this ending couplet this gives the final resolution that malcolm is going to rule scotland from now onwards before i forget uh, let me just give you one information the tragedy of macbeth is coming up uh, in 2022 or 21 i guess i will again uh, give you the exact information alongside while editing and it is by joel quen now if you are familiar with the fargo series you would know that the quen brothers they uh, produced that they directed that and um, well fargo is one of my favorites so i'm really looking forward to this particular rendition of the play and i will really really recommend rather pre recommend uh, this particular tragedy i have already uh, talked about polanski's version uh, which is really my favorite uh, i didn't like the other versions much and i'm really excited about this joel cohen's production of macbeth which i'm sure is going to be amazing um it was a very very long journey when i started doing this series i never thought i could actually complete it because it was a, such a daunting task over 10 hours of content 20 videos what was more difficult is the fact that while making this video series you kids have constantly requested me to make videos on this poem and that poet and this novel and what not and it was very difficult not to actually listen to you it was difficult to ignore those requests but i knew that if i diverted from my course if i stopped macbeth thinking that okay i'll do that later i could never come back i needed this momentum and i'm sorry for keeping you waiting for other things which you wanted me to work on i'll try to take up few short pieces now i really need a break from long series i'm already doing this history of literature series parallelly so now my plan is to make a few videos on some poems which are usually present in most university syllabus so keep on sending your suggestions i will try to address them i want to repeat that if you have missed any of the videos of the macbeth series all the links are given in the description box if you want to revise any one particular scene you can take that up but i will recommend that you should watch the complete series it is just 10 hours 
and investing this 10 hours will really benefit you in the long run. Even if you have completed Macbeth, even if you are pursuing, say, post-grad and Macbeth was part of your UG syllabus, I request you to go through these videos because this text will always help you understand the other texts which you are doing right now. Thank you for all the love and support. I am really, really so very grateful. This is Monami Mukherjee thanking you all once again. Stay happy, stay safe. Bye-bye.